so we're now back with Kaiser Redo, and we now have H.P. Lovecraft in power. So, H.P. Lovecraft, popular author, he gives political power gain plus 3% and plus 4% stability. H.P. Lovecraft, born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1890, is perhaps one of the most mysterious and controversial figures of the 20th century. His father dying when he was 8, his mother dying in a Spanish flu in late 1918, and Lovecraft suffering from a plethora of health issues his entire life. I led Lovecraft into a search for truth and deep meaning, which he channeled into his writings. Tales of darkness and horror within resonated strongly with an America reeling from the 1925 market crash. Lovecraft's science fiction gained a mysterious audience for his thoughts on politics and philosophy. He rapidly gained an almost cult-like status in his home state of Rhode Island and drew many followers, preaching a dark and otherworldly message about supernatural powers and eldritch beings that are incomprehensible to the human mind. The major one of those he wrote about in his books is Cthulhu. Anyway, as president of the New England Literary Society, Lovecraft standardized the use of the English language of print, removing what he called Americanisms. When he traveled to England in 1924 to study the English language and attempt to purify it as much as possible, he witnessed the 1925 uprising and grew an acute hatred of syndicalism. He returned to America in 1930, founded his own newspaper, and ran unsuccessfully for governor of Rhode Island. He remained a prominent thought leader and a powerful influence on the minds of New Englanders, although his opponents accused Lovecraft of being a dangerous man with authoritarian and cultist inclinations. I'm also going to read about the Providence Society and the National Populist. Jesus is alone. Providence Society. During the Felt Creek, untold thousands rushed to the relative safety, stability, and opportunity of America. As war languished on, immigrants flooded New England quickly and unexpectedly ch changing the face of the Northeast. With these diverse new interests came new problems, particularly Native's resentment. These problems were only compounded by the economic recession that set in after the Kaiser fight. The Kaiser Reich began to isolate the United States of America. This discontent was championed by one of New England's most famous personalities, celebrity author Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Lovecraft's meteoric rise to fame in recent years is based on his tales of weird and diabolic fiction seen by both fans and critics as giving force to the xenophobia, economic insecurity, and reactionary instincts of New Englanders. Initially the darling of Boston Brahmins uh, in New England's Anglo-Saxon majority, Lovecraft's work spread like wildfire across the country, turning him into an overnight sensation. The shadow over Innsmouth, one of uh, Lovecraft's most famous novellas, deals obliquely with the threats of state conspiracy and invasion, as well as mis miscegenation and its monstrous consequences. Some of his most ardent followers swear that prophetic astrological portents can be understood through comprehensive study of his work. To many, Lovecraft may just be another insane writer with less than moderate views. To others, he's a prophet that can guide New England to safety. But whatever Lovecraft may be, he's still a shy, reclusive writer, unlikely to take any drastic action. The only ones in New England that wish to see him in power are the extreme Anglophiles. They view Lovecraft as a tool to ensure complete loyalty to Canada. For now, Lovecraft and his small circle of writers stick to Providence and continue on with their lives, only accompanied by small groups of fans and loyalists. National populists, oh god, I can't read about them because it's cut off at the bottom because of that, but the brief thing it says is just accompanying a variety of ultra-nationalist militaristic movements, which unfortunately I can't read about. The New England Civil War, which daily political power gain minus 0.10 and stability minus 10%. In the wake of Order's class, New England has descended into anarchy, and out of that anarchy, the most extreme rise. The main contenders being the rebel forces of Jim Curley in the New England branch of the Irish Republican Army, and the Socialist force to the north. Lovecraft and his extremely Anglophilic faction appear to be on top, and even has the marginal blessing of the crown. Christian resistance. Daily political power gain minus 0.5, stability minus 50%, daily radical social support, but... 0 0.02 and the other social democrats support plus 0 0.02. The feeble-minded Christians are convinced beyond reason that their non-existent God will save them. They have been a thorn in their side ever since we took power and they must be dealt with accordingly. These blind fools will resist us no more. I'm also going to briefly read about the people put in charge of the government down here. Like uh, H.P. Lovecraft obviously the head of the government. But anyway, I think they call them, yeah, just government. So H.P. Lovecraft, head of government, national populace, and providence. Daily political power gain plus 0.15 and stability plus 5%. Let's see, Frank Belknap Long, he's an economy minister, a national populist, and managed market economist. So we get daily political power gain plus 0.04. We lose resource gain efficiency by 
2%, consumer goods factor go down by 3%, and production especially cap goes down by 3%. So not a lot of good things. R.H. Barlow is a foreign minister, also a national populist, and an apologetic clerk. We get 0.04 political power gain from him. And August Derleth is a minister of interior, a national populist, and a terror in the night. We get a daily political power gain plus 0.05. We get local resources plus 5%, local manpower plus 5%, and local factories plus 5%. It also calls him a reactionary. Since we're still part of the Entente, this applies to us. Canada supports a specific government. Today, the Canadian government declared their support for the Pacific States of America as a true and only legitimate claimant to the mantle of American leadership in the wake of their civil war. What about us? While stopping short of promising direct military intervention, they have offered to bolster Pacific forces with equipment and volunteers, as well as an array of military advisors. The advisors they have requested from the New Englander military. The Canadians stated solely that, the Amer that America was required to maintain world order and prevent the dissolution of one of the world's greatest great powers into chaos. We stand ready, which we get a national superior called supporting the Pacific government, which grants max volunteer force divisions plus two, and we can send the volunteer forces. And the uh, Pacific States of America, uh, the Pacific States of America gains assisted us in the Civil War, which their opinion of us goes up by 50. We stand ready. So I want to go look at this uh, spirit if it lets me. Here we go. So it's just their flag with shaking hands, supporting the Pacific government. Yeah, just as the same thing I just read. Lovecraft and Mackenzie King. It is always important for New England to have a strong relationship with our Canadian allies, and thusly meetings with Canadian government officials is the norm. A recent meeting with, was with Lovecraft and Canadian Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King to discuss the border and, this, and the reclamation of the home isles. In this meeting, the two men officially talked politics, diplomacy, and trade between New England and Canada. However, in private, the conversation took a different tone. Mackenzie King is a well-known believer in the spiritual and the unknown and has taken a particular liking to Lovecraft's spiritualism and works. In the private, the conversation shifted from the political to the paranormal and spiritual. Lovecraft and King talked at great lengths about spirits, ghosts, and other paranormal occurrences. Rumor even had it that King and Lovecraft held a seance to communicate with the spirit of the late King George V to ask him for guidance on reclaiming the home isles. So, even though the two may not agree with politics, their belief in the unknown may strengthen the two nations' bonds in these trying times. What a strange fellow. Yeah, they are both kind of strange. The Entente is moving to reclaim Europe. The date has finally come, the date when the birth rate will be reclaimed and Europe liberated. By the thousands, Canadian troops land on the beachheads and push their way to London. The exiles eager to see their home once again. The Entente is inches away from reclaiming their birth rate, reclaiming their nation and their pride. And the native people of England, forced from their homes during the revolution, can hear the chimes of Big Ben, the chimes they had not heard for years. God save the king, God help the Entente. The exiles will no longer be so. Quote of the day, how is the empire, King George V? I forgot we don't really have a choice in this. Our master, the Kingdom of Canada, need our help and called us into the Canadian Communard War. That basically means we're in the set Second Veld Creek now, even though I can do absolutely nothing because I don't have a navy. Anyway, that's fun. Only following orders? While Lovecraft's wisdom is without question among its officers, his penchant for reeds and papers has created multiple conflicts. Direct orders from Providence have dispatched the generals on scribbled out legal documents or penciled into the margins of previously sent commands. This has caused the embarrassing effect of troops being unable to interpret Lovecraft's seemingly nonsensible or contradictory orders due to them being muddled or lost in the sea of scribbles and edits around older messages. I, um, Okay, we shall attack at Wednesday. One of the four will happen. We get a 25 chance of uh, losing war support. We get, we could lose 15 percent. We could lose 15 political power. We can gain, or we could lose base stability by five percent, or lose 12 command power. Uh, I'm gonna read the other options. Uh, this makes perfect. Wait, wait, no, hold on. Hmm, send 40 yards of eggs to Quincy. Our officers will interpret his orders as they wish. Uh, so I could lose 50 political power or one of these four. You know what, I'm gonna... I'll risk it, I guess. Um, we shall attack at Wednesday. I don't know what happened. I can't tell. Great. Lovely. So I finally finished the America's Darkest Hour focus, so I gotta get to God Save the King before I can go down Lovecraft's route. So 
Let's read about this. God saved the king. The people of New England are ungrateful. They took her peaceful intervention as an invasion and tried to rebel against us. They cannot be reasoned with. They must be placed under direct Canadian rule until they are ready to act civil once more. This may not be popular with the people, but we do not need their approval. God saved the king and God helped the people of New England. So we're going to get 100 political power, but also lose 10 stability. Great, we're going to go back into negative stability, I think. Woo. So when I originally got this event earlier, I had no clue who it was, so I looked it up. Fred Trump was Donald Trump's father, like the ex-president Donald Trump. Anyway, Fred Trump flees. In a move surprising nobody, but greatly angering the cyclist, Fred Trump has fled New York City. Knowing he was possibly only days away from an arrest or worse, Trump gathered his belongings, his new wife Mary, and his mother Elizabeth Christ Trump, and fled the city. As it took place during the dark of night, and presumably with the skies, as the cynicalists seem unsure of where he has gone. However, all sides strongly suspect he has fled north to New England, where it is assumed they will be accepted with open arms. Despite these assumptions, though, there is a decision to be made. We should not anger the cynicalists any more than we have to, and since we have tend to remain fairly neutral, a decision one way or another could damage our relations with the various factions of the South. With that being said, we have decided we can either say we have no need for him, or he is a welcome figure. Since in this timeline it says Lovecraft hates the cynicalists and he's our leader, I'm going to do the say that he's a welcome figure just to spite the cynicalist. So he is a welcome figure. There we go. So we finished the God Save the King, so now I can go with the triumph of the Providence Society. I am Providence, and Providence is myself. Together, indissolubly is one. We stand through the ages, a fixed monument set eternally in the shadow of Durfee's ice-clad peak. It is New England I must have, in some form or other. So we'll get a 30% change in national populism, and we'll also get a plus 100 political power. I'm not really sure what's the best way to go about his tree, but I'm going to try to get rid of the negative modifiers first, and this leads to getting rid of the Christian one, I forget what it's called. Anyway, destroy the cold of the past. The new order has taken hold, yet a few hold out patriots nostalgic for the days of the Republic remain. As for these Republicans, how can one regard seriously a frightened, greedy, nostalgic huddle of tradesmen and lucky idlers who shut their eyes to history and science? Steal their emotions against decent human sympathy, cling to sordid and provincial ideas, exalting sheer acquisitiveness and condoning. Oh god, condoning what? And condoning artificial hardship for the non materially shrewd, dwelt smugly and sentimentally in a distorted dream. Cosmos of outmoded phrases and principles and attitudes based on the bygone agricultural handicraft world and reveling conscientiously on. Consciously or unconsciously, many assumptions such as the notion that real liberty is synonymous with the single ego unrestricted economic license or that a r rational planning or resource distribution would contravene some vague and mystical American heritage utterly contrary to fact and without the slightest foundation of human experience. Intellectually, the... The what? Intellectually, the Republican idea deserves the tolerance and respect one gives to the dead. So get ten civility... So the democracy uh, changes by minus 10%, and Mark liberalism changes by minus 5%, and social conservatism changes by minus 5%. So that theoretically should make us more popular, though the other parties as well. So this is the first time I've seen this event. Uh, it wasn't in my test run of this route, but then again, the Veld Craig didn't start this early in my test route. But anyway, the Unpomp and the Rex spec to me. With both the Entente and the Reich expect now at war with the Third International, the Kingdom of Canada has called for a conference between their leaders in the Canadian city of Halifax in order to discuss the possibility of cooperation, and the German Empire has agreed. While it is currently unclear how far such cooperation would go, it seems worth the attempt. A representative from New England has been asked to attend. We'll be there, so I'm curious where this will lead. The Halifax Conference. Leaders from the Entente and the Reich Spacks gathered in Halifax today in order to discuss the possibility of cooperation in the war against the Third International. What this cooperation would consist of was not difficult to ascertain. Military and naval access between all members, but more importantly for the Entente, the willingness on the part of the Reich Spacks to stay out of both France and Great Britain once the war is done. This would allow for a swift return to Europe for the French and British exile governments, the ultimate goal of both. But now a single question hangs over the conference. 
Would the German Empire even agree to such terms? And if so, what would they ask in return? That's an excellent question. I personally hope Germany just lets France and Britain do what they want to. Uh, good France and Britain, not communist France and Britain. We finish the event, destroy the cult of the past. So I'm going to see it all burn. If religion were true, its followers would not try to bludgeon their young into an artificial conformity, but would merely insist on their unbending quest for truth, irrespective of artificial backgrounds or practical consequences. Many falsely equate their movement to revive the Anglo spirit of America to the religious fundamentalists or occult mystics that have taken root in the darkest corners of our nation. Okay. Their beliefs will ultimately betray our movement of religious authority within our ranks and prevent these misguided simpletons from gaining too much power within our ranks. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Change of popularity and national populism by 10% so it goes, we get more popular. We also lose 100 manpower and every own state the infrastructure receives two levels of damage, which that's a bad thing. But anyway, I'm going to do this one to get rid of that, uh, to get closer to getting rid of that bad national focus. Uh, though, that's also about all the time we have for this part, so goodbye for now.